Well, let me welcome to the program, Dr. John and Claire Grabowski joining me today. I want to welcome you. Thanks for being with me. Thank you, Tom, for having us here. Great to be with you. So I'm going to call you John this one time, Dr. Grabowski, but when I first hey, met Dr. you- Hey, Dr. Curran. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, for people who don't know, uh, my first encounter with Dr. Grabowski was at the Catholic University of America, where I was a- lowly student, a lowly student, and he was an exalted, uh, cue the violin music with the angels on the clouds, uh, a professor of moral theology at the Catholic University of America. Do you remember uh, when we first met, uh, Dr. Gabowski, when you first came there? Um, it was a long time ago. It this was, was a, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, Were you there in 91? Because I, 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 I arrived in 92. I right. Okay. So yes. that was at the very beginning. So I was not so exalted. I was a lowly assistant professor sweating out a tenure <laughs> tenure clock. Yeah. Well, and uh it's just so for folks who know, um, I, I'd love to hear just what what's it been like to have a married life that involved a vocation to scholarly work in the field of Catholic theology. I mean, here you are, you're a couple. And, and I say that because my wife and I married 27 years, 28 years on Friday. Uh, oh, this Friday will be 28 years. Um, that has been, it's been a real journey uh, attempting to serve the Lord as a lay person. And you as a Catholic theologian, as a lay person, but a theologian, mm -hmm. and a husband and a father that's called to lead and provide and protect his family. So... How's that for an opening question? <laughs> Let's start with well, the softballs. Come I'll, on. I'll, I guess I'll share my perspective and Claire probably has a somewhat different one. Um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm fortunate uh, in the, that what I teach, um, a lot of it falls in the area of marriage, family, and life issues, mm -hmm. right? So I get to teach undergrads and seminarians and doctoral students in those areas. So Claire and I, we've been married 37 years. Um, and I mean, one of the blessings I would say of this is we've been able to kind of, pardon the expression, couple marriage ministry with what I talk about in the classroom because we, we've been preparing couples for marriage for almost 30 years. We've done post cana marriage ministry. Pope Benedict, for some reason, put us on the Pontifical Council for the Family. So we've done a lot of marriage and family stuff together. So that's been, for me, it's been very nice because it's been a compliment to not only be able to work and think and teach about this, but then actually <clears throat> to be able to share this as a ministry with, with Claire. But there are challenges too, and Claire might mention that. Well, no. Um... I'm not going to mention, I mean, Clara, what I want to know, let's put it out there. Did you know what you were signing up for when you married a <laughs> theologian? I mean, come not on, really. Chance. Let's, let's I, kind of I be, let's be not, honest. Um, not a chance. No, the two things, the, the, the one thing that about being married to a theologian who teaches seminarians and deacons and PhD students and undergraduate students is we can go anywhere in the world. And most only like all of our children live in different parts of the country and when we go to visit them and we go to their parish what does the priest say oh dr grabowski was my professor and that's why we're coming to um spokane St. Mary's. Yeah. because my friend told father jeff about us and the first thing father jeff was dr grabowski he was my my professor in seminary so that's what why we're coming here but um and, and it is a blessing because I love people and I love to meet people and, and hear their stories about coming to the faith. And, but um, I think more importantly, the gift of being married to a theologian is, um, you know, we enter into marriage and John and I've learned this over the years of marriage that the reason we get married and we have children is ultimately to help each other get to heaven. And because of John's background and, because the Lord has used that to strengthen our faith and our desire to help each other get to heaven. We've been able to share this with our children and our life is centered around it. 
You know, our, we've centered around the Eucharist. We've centered around family meals together. And those family meals are where we share our faith, where John shares the teachings of the church. And um, even now that our children are grown, because one of the blessings of COVID, which there aren't many, <laughs> but one of them was that we started a family reading group via Zoom with all our children. And we read, we're dorks. I'm not, uh, but the rest of them are. We read church teachings. John, John did you see what you just did there? Cool. Yeah, did you see what she just you did? You know, it's fine. You want to back the bus up? I didn't nice. say Nice, I like him. that. That was Some good. Some of my kids are too. But it's yeah. just given us an opportunity to grow in our faith and to, to witness. And now we're seeing our children doing the same thing. And we have no other theologians in the family, but we have a few philosophers and, um, we just, it's really cool to see how God has used this to bless us and to, to help us on our journey. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to say, I mean, is that, <laughs> is that, is that the curse of a theologian that he gives birth to philosophers? I mean, how does that even happen? I mean, Apple did, come on. Apple <laughs> fell a little too far from the tree, I think. They went for the handmaid instead of the queen. But yes, I, I thought Claire was going to mention, I mean, there are challenges like you're never going to get rich teaching Catholic theology. Well, hello. I mean, this is the thing, right? Yeah. So this is the, this is one of those things like um, the, the, the blessings, right? But then there are challenges and, and sometimes the challenges are the blessings, right? Like, Often. Hey, I, you know, who would have guessed that having to not have, you know, an abundance financially just coming in through the work you do is somehow helping us stay closer to God and, and understand yeah. God's providence more fully and in yeah. all of that. I mean, I don't know, has that, it, it's sort of like, Hey, you're a moral theologian. Well, let's watch this stuff play itself out in your life. Right. Kind of what you were talking about. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, because it, you know, you go and you give talks and you talk about the importance of living simply as a family. Well, you know, your salary takes care of that yes, in a lot does. of ways. <laughs> so you don't have to worry too much. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, what I want to know, culture. I want to know not if, but how often Claire is saying things at the dinner table and you're like, oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. Come on now. How often is that happening where the theologian is actually behind the curtain there oh, uh, giving you the insights, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, when we give talks together, uh, I mean, I let Claire kind of share our experience. Right. Um, I mean, I kind of focus, I can focus on, you know, what is, what does the church say and what does the Catholic tradition mm -hmm. say on this or that? But Claire then gets to kind of bring it home to people and talk about, yeah, this is what it has looked like in our family. And these have been the blessings. These have been the struggles and challenges that we've had trying right. to do this. Yes. Well, this is uh, it's Dr. John and Claire Grabowski. Uh, Dr. Grabowski teaches at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He's an author of several books, as well as uh, a speaker, along with his wife, in ministry settings around the country. Uh, Dr. Grabowski is coming to St. Mary Catholic Church in Spokane, uh, Spokane Valley, Washington, my parish, if you can believe it, uh, mm -hmm. where Father Jeff Lewis, so you hear him on Mondays on uh, Sound Insight. And all of a sudden, it's like, I saw you guys in the bulletin. That's how I find out that oh, you're wow. is in the bulletin. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I know that guy. He was my professor at that Catholic university. Claire, you've heard that before. Here we go. I've heard it a lot. <laughs> right? And I thought, oh, wow. Not only did I want to make sure to promote what you're doing on Friday night, the 12th, and then all day Saturday on the 13th, we're going to learn a lot about that over the course of our, our conversation, but also to just to give folks a chance to, to get to appreciate the blessing that you are. And, um, and I, I, yeah, I do want to bring up at some point in this interview, um, your most recent book um, on unraveling gender, uh, if that's okay, because it seems like it's such a critical issue uh, of, of our times. And um, it's just, it's so pressing to get, uh, clarity in terms of uh, what's the basis in church teaching for how to address these kinds of things well. So uh, lots to cover in the time that we have. So uh, Dr. Gobowski and Claire, here we go. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and just start kind of coming at you here. So I want to start with uh, married life. You've been married for, is it 37 years, you said, which is amazing. And found out before the interview that 
your youngest child is the same as my oldest child. So I'm going to do with you guys what Carrie, my wife and I do. So we find couples that are just ahead of us and we're like, (laughs) okay, what's coming next? Okay. So you guys got 10 years on us in married life. Your kids are married. You've got grandchildren. And I'm like, okay, help us figure this out because (laughs) none of our kids are married. None of them are in serious relationships. They're discerning their life vocation. Um, I want to hear what's it like to parent kids who are in that kind of circumstance? Like, you know, did you have the shotgun when the, when the boy showed up at the door, John, come on. I mean, like, how did you help your kids discern a life vocation? I just want to start with that. Sure. That's actually one of the things we were going to talk about in one of the talks. It's one of the things we wrote about in one of the books we did together on raising Catholic kids for their vocations. Um, I think the most important thing, and I'm sure you and your wife are on top of this, is if you're going to help your kids discern the Lord's call to them, which is what a vocation is, it's a call, right? Mm -hmm. Based Building on the call to holiness that we all receive in baptism, then the Lord calls us to live that in a certain state in life. Um, But to do that, we have to be able to hear him speak to us, call us. So the most important thing I think is helping our kids develop a regular prayer life, not just through the liturgical life of the church. That's great. That's important. And as Claire said, that's been a pillar for our family, right. but it's also got to be helping them get in the, build the habit of prayer and being there as a sounding board. When, when kids come to you and say, how do you discern? How do you tell if this is what God wants for you? Helping them to have a personal relationship with the Lord. You know, they have to, as I was telling someone last week, you know, as they get older, we have to start surrendering them because they have to own their faith. It can't be our faith that they're living. This has to be something that they take. And that's our responsibility is to foster it as they're growing up, helping them to hear the Lord. I don't know about you, but when the kids are little, they have, their faith is so much more alive and they, they can hear things from God that that we old people can, you know that you know they're just so childlike yeah like, so yeah, Carrie, Carrie brings that up a, quite a bit she talks about those tender years where the kids are just more docile and more receptive uh they're more accepting and, and there's and less talk about those, the culture yes exactly so then now they're okay so I've got five teenagers at home yes pray oh, for God me bless you. hope and, you're getting combat pay <laughs> So, um, and Claire, you used the phrase, and, and John, you referenced something that are near and dear to carry in my hearts, which is <clears throat> give them a foundation in through a life of prayer and a personal relationship with Jesus. Okay, so quick story. Uh, my kids were driving home. I was driving them home from, I don't know, some event at, at the school, and um, my kids kind of cornered me in the car. Uh, I think there were three of the teenagers, three or four of them, four teenagers and a couple of my younger kids driving them home. And they said, dad, why didn't you ever teach us how to have a personal relationship with Jesus? And I'm like, what? That's all we did. I mean, (laughs) this is the crazy thing, right? Like all the times we took them to adoration, Jesus is here, open your heart to him, talk to him, he's here for you and all of this other stuff. And, And I tried to not be defensive. I tried to not be defensive, right? And you now, first of all, I think that's a pretty cool question, right? That my 18 yeah, year old is saying question. to us, right? And um, and what they were doing was they were saying how at the school where they attend, they've been learning how to read the scriptures and pray in a personal way to Jesus. Nice. And and, and here's the here's the crazy thing. These are things that we've done at home for years, mm-hmm. but somehow <laughs> they didn't they didn't hear it, they didn't get it. And, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, there's that idea that somehow if they're not ready, they could hear the words, but it didn't soak in. It didn't it didn't it wasn't hurried. It might have been that they listened to the words, but it wasn't hurried. And and so I just comment on that. I mean, is that a crazy experience or is that something that parents uh, will say? I'll oh, I'll let you yeah. talk in a minute. You go ahead. Huh? But I think it's not that you didn't do it. You planted the seeds. And it was small seeds that they didn't see back then, but it was because of that that they asked you the question. They wouldn't have even wanted a relationship with the Lord if they didn't see that you had one. And 
know that it was important. So you did plant seeds. That's the most important thing. Right. And I mean, there is the whole no prophet is without honor in exactly. his own native place effect here, right? Mm -hmm. You can tell your kids something a hundred times, but they hear it from someone else and it's like, oh, oh, okay. Um, so I think, I think that in the book that I just re referenced, at one point we were trying to think about and talk about mm -hmm. how did we help our the faith take root in our kids, right? And I was like, I don't know. Faith is a gift. Faith is it's infused in us by the Holy Spirit. It's not something we did as parents. Right. And so one of our kids said, hey, dad, why don't you let us write about what worked for each of us in our family's life and practices? What really helped the faith take root? And I was like, wow, yeah, yes, do that. So some of them were really excited and some of them were not excited at all yeah. but everybody wrote a couple of pages just saying and it was just so interesting to read as a parent because it's like we did all the same things as a family but this worked for this kid and right. didn't work for that kid but this over here worked for that kid so it's just like seeing the lord use different things in your family's life and practices exactly. um okay so i want to hear okay one of the, th the devotions that has been foundational for us is the rosary. Yeah. And so family rosary and modeling uh, devotion to the blessed mother, consecration yeah. to the immaculate heart, right? All the like fundamental Catholic stuff. But I got to tell you, it's a grind. It yes. is a grind for these kiddos, for many of them, right? So to your point, um, like Carrie uses the sower and the seeds and saying only one out of four hit, you know, the, the fertile soil. So she's like, look, we got only 25% success right here. Yeah. So um, what did, did the rosary make a game changing difference in, in any of your kids' lives or in terms of how you brought up your kids and um, what would, what worked? I would love to know what worked well, for you. The rosary actually, what our, our son, um, who is, has been married the longest and has the most ch children. Um, he actually, that's what he wrote about. He wrote about how as a teenager, we get in the car to go on vacation or we actually, we, every time we got in the car, but he remembers putting on his, his earphones and ready for a long trip and spending it by himself and dad making everybody get off their earphones and, um, say the rosary together and how, you know, he knew it was his responsibility to participate and he did it, but he, he didn't really want to be there. And now when we are with them, we get in the car and what do we do? We pray the rosary with the, with the grandkids as a family. Do you know how my heart leaps for joy? It is amazing. I just, I just see that those things we did that we didn't think were making a difference really did. And, and one more example is when they were all, um, they were college age. So the, mm. the, we have four children in seven years and then six years later, we have another one. So we got, we didn't have any children in between there. God had a plan. And, um, but um, I can remember them being home after my son's freshman or sophomore year, sitting around the table where we talk and all, and John and I are at both ends. And all of a sudden, one of the boys says, Hey guys, did you ever go to Caldwell Adoration Chapel? And we look at each other and they said, yeah, isn't that great? And he says, yeah, we go there with our team after um, we play ultimate on the way back and we go to the Adoration Chapel. And John and I are staring at each other and we just want to like yell and hooray. Jump out of don't your say seat. anything. Say we nothing. We don't want say them nothing. to know we're how, how excited <laughs> we are. And we just couldn't believe it. So things that we did with them when they were little, they went and did in college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though there was at times resistance when we tried to do it with them because it was, ah, oh, come on. But, you know, yeah. the, there's a power in practices, mm -hmm. right? Not just one-off events. And this is something that we kind of learned as parents. And then we learned in ministry situations in parishes too, is when you do one-off events, it can be good. It can be not good. It, you know, but when it's a regular practice, it helps that seed penetrate the soil more deeply, yes. right? And it gives the Lord a chance to really plant them more deeply in their hearts. Exactly. 
So yeah, definitely the rosary, definitely adoration. So I'd love to know, did you guys, um, a couple of other things that, um, like an area where we fell a little short, according to our kids is, um, <laughs> well, there's a lot of ways we fell short. Well, but, we've got uh, a long so list, we, according to some of our kids. And they remind us of it a lot. <laughs> uh, is um, reading the scriptures um, as part of our family prayer, right? So giving them a sense of a daily devotion in the word. Mm. And so... Um, it's something that the kids are now getting um, more regular exposure to. It's something that our older kids, because of, um, frankly, um, Protestant influences. Now, they're all Catholic, right? But um, their, their evangelical Christian friends mm -hmm. are all deeply in the word. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that they have, through their the influence of these friends and the school they're at, um, have come to be naturally drawn to the word as a, as a source of, you know, being fed spiritually. Um, so you, 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 you know, you guys are this Catholic home, Catholic university was scripture also part of what you did as a family. Um, just wondering. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in different ways. I mean, we didn't just, would you say we just opened the Bible and read, or was it more when we did Liturgy of the Hours together? So, and we... Well, I think it changed because when our kids were little, I mean, so right. Claire and I would be trying to pray in the morning and sip in our coffee, and all of a sudden all these little faces would appear at the bottom of our bed, mm -hmm. and it's like, what do we do with this? Right. Do we shoo them away? Do we stop praying and start, you know, get them breakfast or whatever? Or do we say, no, let's, let's all pray together? And so we, we, went for that option so i would get out my guitar and we'd sing some songs as a family and oh, then man, you're just back. flexing now you're, you're a theologian and you play the guitar oh no. come on not anymore he hasn't played, fair. Fair. I played fair. in some years tom I'm, and no no flexing <laughs> here but oh. um but then we would read we would read a lot That's something true. for the lives of the saints or we'd read scripture and then and so that was kind of our pattern in the morning and then we do different things at night prayer as a family but as our kids, as our kids started to hit their teenage years, suddenly some of them started to become liturgy snobs. Yes. And so they, they were like, <laughs> we don't want to do guitar, you know, we don't want to do praise and worship songs and read Bibles, before read that. lives of the saints. Yeah. So we're like, all right, you want to pray the liturgy of the hours? Let's do night prayer. So, I mean, so the way we engage scripture changed, right. but mm -hmm. it was, I think, a uh, was something I that we so. did and we also did it more over like lent and advent mm -hmm. you yeah. know when we lit the advent wreath we'd always read we, and, yeah we would always do a um, reading as a family every night around the so uh, around you know the table. It, it might not have been constant that we read scripture but um they all did go to catholic college where they did read a lot of scripture in their wouldn't you say sure and church teaching sure and, and i mean the other thing we did was when they were teenagers, in addition to whatever religious education That's they were true. getting through a parish, we read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church together. And that is a deeply scriptural That's book. True. So that gave us the opportunity to dive into, you know, where does the cate why does the catechism say this? Why does the catechism quote this text? Let's take a look. So, okay, hold on. Let's let's let's. I told you we're nerds. They, <laughs> we oh are my nerds. gosh. Okay, <laughs> and, and we own that. We you're own flexing that. Flexing again. All right, come on now. And you probably did it on the skateboard park, right? While you're doing some kind of trick. We, no, we actually right, no. have really athletic <laughs> kids. Not, not they, nearly so cool. They were involved in a lot of sports, but um. But not you know, the parents. Not the, well, not, not the, the parents. parents. Oh, that was some of our kids. Okay, so uh, I I want to I'm, I'm going to continue to mind this again. I'm talking with Dr. John and Claire Grabowski. They're going to be at. St. Mary in Spokane Valley. And, and I just hope that just hearing this interview, you'll want to come out if you're in the area, come and be blessed by their sharing on Friday night, August the 12th, and then Saturday during the day on the 13th. There's a big charge to come. It's called free. So it's a free event. You can thank Father Lewis for that. Please come to St. Mary's in Spokane Valley. You'll love the event. Again, I'll mention this again as the, uh, as the interview goes on. So um, I want to I want to go into two directions. The first is this: is that uh, actually no, I'm going to skip it. I was going to just say you dove into the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and that got me excited. But I know that there are many folks listening who are saying, um, "I'm not married to a moral theologian." Right. And you mentioned 
they have other that the two of you get up in the morning you have your coffee and you pray so there are folks listening who are like i'm married but my husband doesn't really understand the idea of spiritual leadership in the home i mean he comes to church with me um but a prayer life i you know what I don't know. So what would you say to couples regarding this idea that there's a vocation that is associated with the sacrament and that um, they're, they're trying to figure stuff out. They're just trying to make their way forward. Um, listening to all of this, what's your message to them? I would say um, it's really important. Well, two, two thoughts. One, it doesn't, have you don't have to you know s suddenly um devote yourself to five hours of prayer as a family a day right it can be mm -hmm. five or ten minutes in the morning exactly. and five or ten minutes at night where you just quiet yourself come into the presence of the lord um thank him for your day um ask his blessing spend a little time reading a bit of scripture there are some great devotional guides out there for Catholics to use like the Magnificat or the word among us or right. So let me dive in. I'm going to stop you there because you just said a whole bunch of words that some guys are like, I have no idea. Get into the presence of God, settle, be quiet and, and thank the Lord for my day. Help me understand, ground it even more, ground sure. it even more. What does that mean for a guy who's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, when we were at, when we were undergrads at Franciscan University back in prehistoric times. It wasn't even called Franciscan University. No, it was the University of Steubenville. <laughs> we were very fortunate and very blessed to have um, a, a, a wonderful holy priest who became a dear family friend of our family, Father Francis Martin, who took it on himself to teach students there to pray. And he said, whenever you pray, you should do at least four basic things. Praise God in some way, and you can do that by reading a, one of the Psalms. The mm -hmm. Psalms are mainly just hymns of praise. Read a Psalm. Um, examine your conscience, repent, right? Look for the sin in your life and ask the Lord's forgiveness where you see sin. Listen to the Lord, and I find I listen a lot better when I start with scripture and allow the Lord to speak and then just spend mm -hmm. some time listening. And then just pray for your needs. And think about the Our Father. All four of those basic acts of prayer mm -hmm. in the Our Father. Praise of God, um, asking forgiveness, uh, asking petition, and asking God to supply us with our daily food, our daily sustenance, of right. nourishment in the Word and in the Eucharist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mass does all of those things too. Right. That's. I would encourage people who um, want to begin growing in their faith, especially as a family, to go to mass together, mm -hmm. to make sure that is the, the center of their lives. And then um, as I think we'll probably share, maybe not we share a lot of that St. John Chrysostom says, come home and talk about the readings. Mm -hmm. Talk about it, come have food together and talk about what you learned at mass, what the priest spoke on. If the Lord spoke to you, he will speak to you, but you have to listen. And if you're, if you know, I have to go home and share with my kids what I got out of mass, you're going to pay more attention. Mm -hmm. You know that? And if your kids know that question's exactly. coming, they're going to do the same. So. Yes. Oh, I love this. So now we're talking about, uh, we'll talk about the mass a little bit more. And I want to come back to your vocation uh, of um, uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony um, for folks to access that grace. Um, when you brought your kids to mass, one of the challenges that um, we've faced is, let's call it a mass that, that tends to be more casual versus one that tends to be more reverent. And how reverence not only fosters a sense of holiness and the presence of God as a transcendent God whom ought to be worshiped, but also um, it helps the kids be able to um, realize okay, there's something here that is important and I ought to pay attention to it. So when you, let's say, made a commitment to a particular parish and even a, a, maybe a particular mass at that parish, how important was that in terms of helping foster faith in your kids? Well, um, now 
Um, and we will probably talk about, I can't, I don't know exactly what we're talking about yet. I, I've just been thinking about it. But um, one of the things that we talk, especially when we do marriage preparation, is the importance of, I like to call it the two tables, that um, going to the table of the Lord together and going and coming to the dinner table together is where we get fed. We get fed by the word, by the, the Eucharist, which is the most important thing. But then we, we get fed at the dinner table where we share food. We talk about what God's doing in our life. We, you know, we talk about the church and, um, but we have always made it the priority in our family that Sunday mass comes before everything that, uh, our kids were very involved in sports. Um, we try, you know, we, we, we kept them to one sport at a time each. That was, that was another rule. But if they had games on Saturday, you know, we went Sunday morning. If they had games on Sunday, we went Saturday um, to mass. But if the games interfered with mass, we didn't make it to the games. Mass was the most important thing in our life. Um, wouldn't you agree? Sure. I mean, yes, making it a priority, I think, um, getting in terms of getting kids to engage, Tom, I'm, I, when our kids were little, one of the things we did was we sat in the front pew. Exactly. Because then they there were no distractions in front of them. They could just see what was going on on the altar. And yes, it also meant we were under a microscope because the whole church was watching. <laughs> Who's this weird family? And they're all in Packer gear sitting in the front of the church. Yeah, we got her out through that. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. Did we? Um Packer ties, John would wear. <laughs> um, so, so, but so, get, fi looking for ways to get them to engage. But then again, as I mentioned, as our kids got to be teenagers, they did start to become liturgy snob snobs to some degree, and so the 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 reverence of the liturgy and yeah. where we went to liturgy became much more important to them, and so we did try to give them a voice in yeah. terms of let's find. A, a celebration of the Eucharist that the whole family is uplifted by can enter right. into. Um, and some of our kids, I mean, today, some of our kids prefer, you know, Latin mass, either Novus Ordo or even uh, the older form. Um, some of our kids prefer Reverend Novus Ordo, but, you know, uh, definitely reverence became a more important consideration as our kids got oh. older and so we had to say all right we're gonna again whatever helps our kids plug in that's our priority mm -hmm. i love that well and I, it it feels like uh so back when we were together at catholic university so early 90s it was a different world uh, so much has changed in terms of the culture i, I call it an elijah oh. moment where you know elijah faces down the Israelites, you know, how long will you straddle the issue if the Lord is God, follow him, if Baal, follow him, but the people did not respond, right? Mm -hmm. And that the, the moment of the people not responding is going away. And it's, you're either going to follow Baal or you're going to follow the Lord. And there are many cultural issues that are bringing that out. And I think that a reverent mass is not um, irrelevant here. I think a reverent mass um, makes it clear the Lord is God heaven is our true home things pass away here and let's be careful what we're going to put um we're going to make our our treasure right that uh that this journey is a journey towards our our true eternal home and and kids you've got to be aware of that you yes. know this is yeah. this means that we're not going to always fit in and it means we're going to have to sometimes be willing to stand up speak out and push back um and, and be so, the odd family or the mean parents yes. yeah yeah, yeah. And, and the way that it happened in our family's life, it was the kids would say to us, why are we so extreme, right, <laughs> right, compared to the other families? And this was right. in the Catholic context. So, um, and, and thanks be to God, you know, the kids aren't there now, but that was the culture that they were being brought up in. And we literally moved to Spokane. Uh, we weren't from Spokane. We moved here in order mm -hmm. to be in a healthier environment. Good. So. Um, but again, I'm talking with uh, Dr. John and, and Claire Grabowski. They're they're coming to Spokane Valley uh, this weekend, Friday this uh, 12th and Saturday the 13th of August. 
uh, to speak to the parish Friday night and then again all day Saturday, some beautiful, tremendous teachings on marriage and family, raising, uh, living your life uh, as a married life full of uh, God's grace and navigating the different challenges of the vocation of being husband and wife, as well as parents. And they'll answer any question you have about the Catholic faith quickly. I'm just, uh, <laughs> oh, come on, John. Hey, I had to do that. I had Fake to do news, that. Tom. John, come on, man, yeah. let's go. Um, but I want to come back around to this idea of pressing moral issues hmm. um, because of a book that you just um, recently um, released called Unraveling Gender, The Battle Over Sexual Difference. So Dr. Grabowski wrote this book, this battle over sexual dif uh, difference. Boy, did you... Uh, I mean, as you were writing this book, like, did you have any idea how much of a tidal wave was coming? You could probably read the signs, um, but, you know, it's, it is everywhere. Yes. Um, no, I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't see the full extent of the wave as you've, as you've described it for sure. But I mean, the real catalyst was, I mean, this was my dissertation research 35 years ago, right? It was on gender. Um, and it was always on my to-do list to go back to that and kind of update it and get it out. Um, but there were always other things. So like I kids. like kids or like other public <laughs> publications. Say but, your wife, uh, say your wife. No, John, John, I thought you were a wise man, man. You should have said, said honoring, honoring my wife. She, yeah. But, um, so, but I think what, what, the Lord used to kind of put it back on the front burner for me was um, I was at the 2015 Synod on Family and I was speaking to bishops from all over the world who were saying, who were telling me, you know, we keep hearing these warnings about gender ideology, but we don't understand what is that? Where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. And how do we offer a better alternative to the, to our, our people and to the culture? And I was like, well, if our bishops are asking those questions, this is important. Um, we got to, I got to do something, do something sooner rather than later. And so I was praying about writing a different book. I was planning to write a different book. And one day in prayer, the Lord just said, no, this is the time yeah. you need to go back to this. So it's like, okay. So I did. Um, but no, that clearly, <laughs> just since it was published back in March, watching the, the, the culture continue to literally unravel around this question and pe the confusion to just grow and the, the horror that this medicalized self-harm is inflicting on people and families, um, it's, beco it's becoming more and more clear. Well, and I, one of the, I would say one of the important, uh, factors in your book is that you provide a reasonable theological that it, it's not just faith-based but it's also a rational attempt to say mm -hmm. look this is a healthy thing that will lead to flourishing if you say god made us male and female and let's 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 unpack that that's not a threat to someone's sense of uh self-esteem and um and and to be able to then say Okay, bishops, priests, you see this book? This this will be a tool in your toolkit to get some backbone. Because yeah. if we can't be charging and and uh calling upon husbands and wives to take a stand on behalf of their children and other children, that it matters that our kids have this peaceful uh time where they can um uh, come into uh, gently and at the right age and stage their awareness of their sexual identity and realize they can flourish as male and female. We need that message spoken every day and in every way to counteract, again, the horrors that are pouring through TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and through Amazon Prime and through Netflix. And let's say it all out loud. I am Disney. saying it out loud and in public schools. Mm -hmm. And if the Catholic church can't be a strong voice to stand up to the revealed truth of God and the medical truth of God and the, uh, the psychological truth of God, you know, that is just so abundantly clear unless it's cleverly, pervasively, intimidatingly presented uh, in, in the form that this um, 
this demonic ideology that is being spread. Um, we need we need voices. How do I really feel? Right? Come on. <laughs> it's not clear at all. Yeah. But no, no, I I couldn't agree more. And I mean, it's what's I think hopeful and compelling is as you alluded to, Tom. This is where the the church our reading of scripture as a church the gift of the body the gift of being male and female the way in which this is integral to god's plan and purpose for us all the scientific and medical data we have confirms this right so it's not like it's not like we're we're uh promoting kind of this quirky esoteric fideistic medieval yeah uh, it's, it, no no yeah. the the science is totally on our side on this right. right because i mean just one for me one really kind of arresting statistic people who fully transition chemically surgically are 19 times more likely to commit suicide than people who don't why because medicalizing self-harm to treat an ache in your identity does not work. Mm -hmm. What that person needs is appropriate counseling to work through the pain and the issues that gender dysphoria causes. But you can't do a medical solution to a psychological problem and expect good results. It does not work and the data shows it. Well, when you have a clever, seductive, pervasive presentation on social media, that is washing over kids to get them at a stage in their life where guess what? The dawning of self-awareness and sexual identity is confusing. It is a time where they're trying to belong and they're trying to get a sense of who they are. And all of a sudden, if they're being, if their condition is being named cleverly, then all of a sudden they'll accept the diagnosis of what that feeling state is. Right. And it's obvious that probably you know your your sense of what your gender identity is isn't what you thought it was it's so demonic it is so evil yes. and where are we just speaking out against that and just saying kids you're it's a lie and it's destructive and you'll regret it and it, it will harm you and, and it, it to underscore your point tom and i totally agree we need our bishops and our priests to stand up and teach here and not be afraid to take this on but we need parents too yeah. we need parents stepping up and especially men yeah. um i just saw a study that was done this year that said in two parent homes where you, where father is in the family the average father and child have school aged children have 30 minutes of one to one interaction in a given week that same child will spend 35 to 40 hours on the internet, on social media, watching videos, consuming all kinds of other toxic streams from the culture. So who's really forming and influencing that child, mm -hmm. right? So this is where we have to be willing to be the mean parents yes. and we have to be willing to set limits and have the switch that shuts down our kids' technology devices. That's right. Yeah, they're referring to the app that I showed them. My kid wanted to, kids wanted to watch the TV, but the default setting for the TV is it's paused. It's not. It's not a smart TV. It is. It is knocked out. So, um, I, I only have a few minutes left with you guys. Um, there's an area that I know that has impacted your life, and that's the Holy Spirit, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I'm sensing and seeing around the country that is a surprising sign to me is a resurgence of charismatic renewal, charismatic gifting, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, there's like a new wave of signs and wonders, uh, expectant faith. Uh, I, I see it happening. And, and, and it's, it's something that I wasn't attempting to foster. It wasn't something that I was looking for. It has come to me in the form of all of these folks who are like, where's the charismatic praise and worship? Where's the power of the Holy Spirit? Where's the sense of openness to God moving with power? Um, okay, here you are, this moral theologian, this couple that is doing ministry that would be considered very standard and traditional. What part, if any, boy, there's a leading question, does the charismatic renewal or the power of the Holy Spirit have, has it had in your married life in terms of something that's important? Well, we met 
at actually we met at our a come and see weekend at the University of Steubenville as high school seniors and um I being from New York and John being from um Wisconsin so we met halfway halfway between us but um and we both attended youth conferences all during our high school years um and we have been involved in um couple of different communities that we attended prayer meetings at. And I'm going to tell you that um, I have, I probably went through my first life in the spirit seminar when I was about seven years old. Um, <laughs> um, I saw, I saw the Holy spirit working in my mother's life when she was in a very difficult time. And um, I saw her change from an anxious, worried person to a joyful, peaceful person. Mm -hmm. And I knew at that age that I wanted that. And so um, I, I have to say, I think the Holy Spirit has been my guide all of my life. And I have tried, you know, John and I um, pray and hear the Lord in totally opposite ways. And, and our kids know it. And they know that if, if, if God says something to mom or if mom sees something that, you know, makes her think of, of a miracle or she's going to share it with us, you know, and that's just the way I live my life. So um the Holy Spirit is really important in my life and, and in our marriage. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, the Holy Spirit for me was instrumental in my conversion or reversion to the faith in high school. Um, the experience of, at, at, as we shared a little bit about being, being at Steubenville as an undergrad and being taught how to pray, how to have a regular prayer life. Right. Mm -hmm. And seeing how the liturgy of the church can be enriched and deepened and made even more beautiful by bringing charismatic worship into it um, and without losing any of the reverence, right? And I've seen, you know, you, you, you can do it in a way that you do kind of start losing sight of the reverence, but I've seen it done well. And that's, I think it's powerful. Um, so yeah, and as Claire said, we've learned as a couple as important as it is for us to raise our, our kids and our family life and everything we need christian community around us yeah. we can't do this we're our little domestic church is just a cell in the body of christ and if we're not plugged into other people who are really right. trying to intentionally live their faith um yeah. we're not going to flourish exactly but but the other thing that i just want to comment on is um raising our children yes we did involve them some in the charismatic renewal. We'd go to prayer meetings sometimes. Um, as they got older, it wasn't what they wanted. And I think what one thing we did right was that we allowed them to choose their path towards holiness. And they didn't have to follow the same exact ways that we prayed, even though we taught them and we shared with them what God was doing in our lives. Um, we let them discover the way God wanted them. And, and John and I, you know, don't, don't participate too much in, in that, in prayer meetings right now. It's not that we don't like, and we just, our life has gone in a different path. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay yes. for our kids to see that. Right. All right. Last question. Uh, this is a, the, the, the speed round. Uh, as you scan the horizon, we're all called to discern the signs of the times, interpret them in the light of the gospel. Um, what's your sense about, like, let's call it a sign of hope, a sign of what you see God doing to uh, awaken his church, strengthen his church, equip his church to fulfill the call that is ours in this moment? What's a sign of hope that you see? I mean, we were just talking about the charismatic renewal and how you see that kind of um, gathering gathering momentum. I think all of the 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 lay movements are just signs of the Holy Spirit working within the working within the church, drawing people to not just be you know mass on Sunday Christians or Catholics, but to to want more, to hunger, to go deeper. And the different movements have different ways of channeling people toward that and ch channeling that grace. Mm -hmm. But I mean. It's clear the Lord's working. And as you said, I think very, very aptly earlier, this really is a time of decision, right? Are we going to serve Baal or are we going to serve the Lord? 
Um, and that choice is becoming more clear looking at the culture every day. And the, the other thing I would add is John and I have a lot of experience with young people because of being at the university. And um, even though I don't teach there, I interact with them a lot. And we actually have worked with so many couples in marriage preparation. Um, most of, a lot of them, John's graduate students now, some of his undergraduate students. And I'm going to say my, the hope that I'm seeing is more young people want to be prepared to get married they want to get married in the church we're seeing it there's they're getting married younger again and they want to raise catholic families they want to start you know they want to make the eucharist a big part of their family and and they, they want to dive into the grace of the sacrament exactly and, and it's, not just jump through a hoop that the church says they have to exactly and i think that's really exciting that is exciting. I haven't heard that, but I love it. It, it strikes me as, as true now that you say it, but I don't have that frontline experience the way that you do, Claire. Well, this, is, this has been a, a really fast hour, if you can believe it. It has been. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Dr. John Grabowski, Claire Grabowski, uh, wonderful couple. They're going to be here in Spokane Valley at St. Mary Catholic Church beginning on Friday evening. This is August the 12th. On this Friday, I believe it begins at 6.30. Come on out at 6.30. And then on Saturday morning, they'll be out as well uh, through the day. I think it starts is at 8.30 or 9 in the morning. I, possibly 9. I, I'm really not sure. Um, yeah. We're in the middle of some email. I'll announce pages. it later in the week. So Thank folks, you. just this question mark is out above the our paper. I'd like to hear it too. <laughs> mark the calendar Saturday. Set it aside for Dr. Grabowski and his wife, Claire. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a blessed time. And I just want to thank you both for coming and taking time to be with me today on the program. Thank you so thank much you for John. having us. Yes.